Celebrating 45 years on the air, award-winning Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, remember panic buying? It's back. This time, it's countries, not shoppers. Plus, fertilizer, Russia hiking prices. The USDA says it's time for American-made. And southern gardening won't be long before spring. Gary shows how to make it extra colorful. And in our feature, a look back at this year's Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everyone, I'm Zach Ashmore. And I'm Mike Russell. Thanks for joining us once again here on Farm Week. As the war in Ukraine escalates, rising fear beyond the death and destruction that food insecurity there and many other places around the globe will also escalate. Politico is reporting that some countries are scrambling to find new sources of staples like grain that were heavily exported from Ukraine before the invasion. Recently, the price of wheat reached an all-time high, prompting the G7 to say that countries who refuse to export food products would spike prices and potentially trigger a global shortage. G7 ministers say they are, quote, closely monitoring markets affecting the food system. Russia is one of the world's largest suppliers of fertilizer, prompting a supply chain disruption there as well. Now, the USDA has announced it will support more production of American-made fertilizer to help farmers fight rising costs. Starting this summer, it'll make $250 million available through a new grant program designed to spur independent production. Fertilizer prices have more than doubled since last year, thanks to Russian price hikes, high energy costs, increased demand, and a lack of competition in the fertilizer industry. The U.S. Forest Service has launched Confronting the Wildfire Crisis, what it describes as a robust 10-year fire mitigation strategy. There will be some challenges, though. The work is grueling, the pay is low, and housing for firefighters is limited. The agency is already ramping up for this year's fire season. We'll follow up. A company in Oregon says seaweed is nutritious and sustainable and hopes you'll buy it from them. Oregon Seedweed in Garibaldi, Oregon, says its product has twice as much protein as soy and is actually carbon negative. You can buy five pounds of its popular Dulce Seaweed for $90. In other news, days ago, the president signed a massive spending bill into law, funding the government through the end of the fiscal year. Some of that money will help with projects designed to reduce risk in flood situations, easing the movement of grain and other cargo on the Mississippi River. Peter Tubbs reports. Projects along the Mississippi River to lessen exposure to weather events and expand river infrastructure are nearing their starting line. Mayors of cities that line the Mississippi River met virtually this week to discuss accessing federal funds that have been allocated to reduce risk to flooding and climate change induced weather damages. Project assessments often fall to specialists. We take a forward looking approach with climate projections and then we always are setting that in the historical context and really looking at what could happen and then look just to the landscape on what sort of natural infrastructure um, can take up some of that flood storage. Lock and Dam 25 near Winfield, Missouri is the first large project in line for refurbishment. Doubling the length of the lock chamber will reduce transition times for barges on the river. And what the uh, brick and mortar piece is gonna do to that is that's gonna include a 1200 foot chamber so that the toes, when they go through there, they won't have to break in half. And that reduces the passage time and so forth. This will allow them to go through a one piece without breaking in half, cuts the time down from about a 45 minute transition down to about a 10 to 15 minute transition. The funding for the river projects came from the Biden administration's Infrastructure and Jobs Act of 2021. The price tag for the modernization of Lock and Dam 25 is $732 million. Lock and Dam 25 is the lowest lock on the main channel of the Mississippi River. The facility has been in service since 1939. Even as the war in Ukraine dominates the news cycle, a new study says the Amazon rainforest may be losing its resilience because of climate change. Closer to home, climate change is blamed by some for severe weather affecting crops. John Torpy has more. As farmers look forward to spring and getting into the field, they must do so through the lens of uncertain weather patterns. 
In the Midwest, pockets of warm air collided with western low-pressure systems, spawning an early arrival for severe weather and tornadoes. In Iowa, 13 confirmed tornadoes tore through the southern third of the state in a single day. One twister, measured as an EF4 tornado, traveled 70 miles with sustained winds of 170 miles per hour. The storm struck the town of Winterset, killing seven people. Preliminary damage estimates across the Hawkeye State were calculated at nearly $1 billion. Precipitation was widespread, with some areas of the region receiving 200 percent of normal weekly totals, according to the U.S. Drought Monitor. In Colorado, U.S. Forest Service personnel are having difficulty completing wildfire prevention work due to drought conditions brought on by a reduced snowpack. The lower levels are hampering efforts to safely ignite controlled burns that help reduce fuel load on the forest floor. U.S. forestry officials are trying to double the number of scheduled burns to help reduce the risk of larger wildfires later in the year. We know in the West that we're going to see more large wildfires and, and an increase in the wildfire season simply because it will be longer due to that lack of snowpack. New strategies for combating wildland fires are being explored by the U.S. Forest Service, thanks in part to the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act of 2021. $4.5 billion has been appropriated to the federal agency for wildfire mitigation over the next five years. Similar wildfire predictions can also be heard further to the west, as expanding drought conditions are forecast for portions of Oregon, Washington, and Idaho for the spring and early summer of 2022. The U.S. Drought Monitor calculates 74 percent of the Pacific Northwest is in some version of drought. As far as the wildfire risk, um, you know, it, there's just going to be elevated risk and it's going to depend on how the spring precipitation season plays out. And then, you know, it's a little bit of a, a wild card. So we'll just have a drier than normal landscape and, you know, the risk will just be there. Uh, but we do not know at this point exactly, you know, if this going to be worse than normal, um, you know, the risk will be there. On the lighter side in our southern gardening segments, we spend a lot of time talking about color. With Mississippi's rich soil and abundant water supply, it's easy to create an explosion of color. And with that, here's horticulturist Gary Bachman with one of the most colorful flowers there is. I think one of the classic summer plants for our Mississippi gardens has to be bougainvillea. This tropical plant is perfect in a hanging basket or container on the porch and patio. Today's Southern Gardening is visiting Rivers Nursery for a good look at these plants that require little care and can return many years of enjoyment. These bougainvillea baskets will develop long arching branches as the summer progresses. Be careful when handling because of the sharp thorns on the stems. The flowers are available in a variety of colors, but did you know they're not actually flowers? They're really modified leaves called bracts and have a papery texture and surround the white tubular flowers. Best growth is achieved by full sun exposure. These plants are also heavy feeders and will benefit from monthly applications of water-soluble fertilizer. But the plants actually require very little irrigation, so be careful not to overwater in between feedings. Bougainvillea will begin to bloom in the spring and fall. The flowers are produced in cycles of about six weeks, followed by a rest period. Bougainvillea can be pruned any time to keep the plant neat. Pruning after a flowering cycle will encourage branching, which leads to more flowers during the next bloom cycle. In the fall, bougainvillea should be brought inside and placed in a window with high light for indoor flowering to brighten the winter months. The Rivers family brought this plant into the greenhouse many years ago, and look how it has grown into a bougainvillea tree. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. We'll take a short break right here, but stick around. Coming up on our Farm Week feature, we'll have this year's Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions. 
It was year 53 of this beloved event, the grand finale for young people competing with more than 2,200 animals and an all-time sales record of nearly half a million dollars. You meet a couple of young ladies who epitomize showmanship and competitive spirit. The Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions coming up on Farm Week. Don't go away. I believe in people and their hopes, their aspirations and their faith. I believe in my own work and in the opportunity I have to make my life useful to humanity. I believe that education is a lifelong process and the greatest university is the home. That my success as a teacher is proportional to those qualities of mind and spirit that give me welcome entrance to the homes of the families that I serve. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. I believe in people and their hopes, their aspirations and their faith. I believe that education, of which extension work is an essential part, is basic in stimulating individual initiative, self-determination, and leadership. I believe that these are the keys to democracy and that people, when given facts they understand, will act not only in their self-interest, but also in the interest of society. I believe in intellectual freedom to search for and present the truth without bias and with courteous tolerance towards the views of others. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. Time for the market report. Once again, things still very much in flux due to the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. That's right, Mike, and there may be a few surprises for us as well. But first, we'll talk about the numbers, then move on to this month's WASD report. And finally, the wheat markets fluctuating in ways both domestic and global. Row crops still on the upswing, but not entirely. Wheat dropping in price while livestock prices slightly up. Let's take a look. Last week's biggest loss, lumber falling about $293. It's followed by wheat dropping 102 and a half cents. We'll get into why in a moment. Last week's biggest gain, corn and soybeans rising 10 and a half cents and 19 and a quarter cents respectively. This month's WASDE report dropped last week and you would think it'd have a larger effect on the markets. We usually talk about that, but right now are some strange times. And although it gives us an idea of what's going on agriculturally, larger issues are moving the markets. Either way, here's what it said. U.S. wheat supplies lower due to lower imports, reduced by 5 million bushels. Exports also lower by 10 million bushels. Projected ending stocks higher. Projected season average farm price, $7.50 per bushel. Global wheat shows higher production. Lower exports due to ongoing Ukraine conflict. Global use forecast lower. Global ending stocks raised to 281.5 million tons. U.S. corn shows increased food, seed, industrial use, and exports with smaller stocks. Corn use for ethanol raised. Projected season average farm price, $5.65 per bushel. Global corn production and exports higher, especially for the U.S. and India. Global ending stocks down 1.3 million tons. U.S. rice exports lower by 1 million hundredweight. Ending stocks up 1 million hundredweight, but down 21% from last year. Season average farm price, $14 per hundredweight. Global rice shows larger supplies in production, mostly from India. Global consumption and trade higher as well. Projected global ending stocks are record 190.5 million tons. U.S. soybeans show higher exports with lower production. Soybean oil used for biofuel reduced while exports raised. Season average farm price, $13.25 per bushel. Global soybean production lower, 10.1 million tons, mostly due to Brazil and Argentina's crop. Global crush also lowered. Trade reduced 6.4 million tons to 158.6 million. Global stocks lowest since 2015 and 16. U.S. pork and broiler production lower while beef and turkey production higher. Egg production also lower. Beef and pork imports raised. 
broiler and turkey exports lowered. U.S. milk production lowered on lower dairy cow numbers. Fat basis import forecast also lower. Price forecast for cheese, butter, nonfat dry milk and whey raised. 2022 all milk price forecast, $25.05 per hundred weight. U.S. cotton forecasts unchanged from last month. Projected price forecast also unchanged at 90 cents per pound. Global cotton stocks lower, consumption higher, expected to grow 2% from last year. Projected world production, 500,000 bales lower. So, wheat numbers down, could be a hitch, and we'll see numbers rise again. However, as always, there's more to the story. Market analyst John Roach says this correction had a lot to do with the international markets. Well, the prices moved up to record high levels before they uh, stopped their decline, and they did it in, in a pretty exciting fashion. We were limited up uh, for several days in a row. Um, prices in the United States are actually a little bit higher than uh, what they are in the rest of the world. It, we, we just got out a little ahead of ourselves here. And so the, um, uh, the market kind of softened to, to come down to equalize itself with the rest of the world. When you have the, uh, a market that's reacting to the war situation that we have, uh, it, uh, it becomes extremely volatile. And, uh, uh, and at these high price levels, uh, the volume of trade uh, can get to be uh, uh, quite unpredictable. You have to uh, uh, make a decision about what they're going to do with the crop or what they'll be able to do with their crop uh, in uh, Ukraine. Uh, the wheat uh, is uh, reaching a stage where it needs to be fertilized uh, in order to, It's because most of their wheat crop there is a winter crop, so it's already in the ground, but it needs to be fertilized. And, uh, uh, and the question is how they'll be able to get that job done uh, in the midst of the conflict that's going on and, and will their fertilizer be available. Uh, so the attitude is that we're gonna reduce the crop there uh, sharply uh, but we don't know to the extent, and it, and it could possibly be that we lose most of it, or it's possible we could just lose a portion. Uh, but meanwhile, uh, uh, the, the market has to trade this almost on a daily basis as we're getting the news from the area, and, uh, uh, and the news has been quite erratic. Well, China is a big, very big wheat producer, and, uh, and we also have uh, our hard red winter crop in this country uh, suffering from dry conditions. So, uh, uh, and, and, and we have dry conditions up in, uh, in some of the northern, re northern regions as well for the spring crop. So we really have uh, a, a real dicey situation that uh, any way that we work the numbers through, we're going to have to reduce the demand, ration the demand uh, with price. And, the, and so the question becomes one, what, what price does that take? And, um, and markets uh, will be searching that price out uh, really on a weekly basis as we go forward. And we, and we start to fill in some of the blanks about crop sizes in various locations. And that's it for a deeper look into the markets. Things still changing every day with global issues always affecting everything these days. It gets very strange and the markets are definitely reflecting that. Mike? Thanks, Zach. Next, the story you've been waiting for, coverage of one of the preeminent youth events in the state, the Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions. More than 1,500 young people from across Mississippi participated. Those who won champion and reserve champion were featured in The Sale. Barn Week's Jonah Holland brings you this year's feature. Thank you, God bless you. Let's enjoy the Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions. And with those words, Mississippi's Ag Commissioner Andy Gibson kicked off the 2022 Sale of Junior Champions. It was the 53rd year of the sale, a chance for youth in 4-H and FFA to strut their stuff showing livestock. In a way, that's been tougher the last couple of years because of the pandemic. This year, though, the crowd showed up in a big way, and so did the buyers. In all, 46 animals were bid on, raising nearly $450,000, a new record for the Dixie National. The top sale, $22,000 for the grand champion steer out of Hines County. Animal-wise, a record number of participants from across the U.S. showed more than 1,100 head of livestock, a huge success, and 39 scholarships totaling more than $61,000 were awarded, bringing the total scholarship money given since 1993 to more than a million dollars. 
getting one of those scholarships, Tatum Madden out of Covington County, Mississippi, southeast of the state's capital in Jackson. She's been showing livestock for 10 years and says success definitely starts with preparation. Oh my goodness, without thinking ahead and preparation, you would get nowhere. You would be running around crazy, stressed out 24 seven. Like that is key to all this is preparation and just planning ahead of time. So if you do have those bumps in the road, you're prepared for everything else so you can take a minute and stop, fix that and then keep going on and you won't have a big old mess in the end. Lily Putnam out of Sunflower County in the Mississippi Delta had a lamb in this year's sale. She's been showing livestock since she was seven years old and earned $7,000 for her Mississippi bred reserve champion. She agrees that preparation starts long before the sale of junior champions and it doesn't stop in the parking lot of the show. When you're pulling up to a show, as soon as you step off the trailer, preparation starts. Um, it, with sheep, it's a not, it's an ongoing thing. You get off the trailer, you get them in the pens, you get them settled down, and you're in the wash rack, and then you're on the shearing stand, and you're clipping sheep, you're drying sheep, you're working leg wool. Um, you're making sure every little detail is meticulously looked after and making sure that that animal is completely ready to go in the ring and look its best on that day. Like most participants in the Dixie National, both 4-H'ers have busy schedules. A day in their lives comes with its own set of challenges. So a day in the life of raising livestock for my family is pure chaos. Um, we're all big into sports, so we're getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning and going out and feeding. Uh, my sister is a competitive gymnast, so she's in the gym 16 hours a week. So it's really, it, it's a lot of work um, before school for sure and after school when we get home if the weather's right we're outside we're walking we're working on showmanship and if the weather's not right we're treadmilling in the barn or we're setting them up or we're standing them on the table and working leg hair it's just it's never ending it really isn't we're in the barn some nights at 12 o'clock treadmilling sheep and it's just it's 24 7 365 every day we have an animal we're doing something with them. What I like least about sh uh, showing cattle would be the early mornings. I hate them so much. I'm not a morning person whatsoever. Anybody who knows me knows I do not like it. I like the late nights, but on the other hand, you got to get up early in the morning. But that's what pays off in the end and your hard work and dedication, that's what really pulls you through. All the challenges and hardships and the skills these young people learn along the way do eventually add up to a positive outcome. Lily plans to become a veterinarian someday. She says her time in 4-H has helped her grow and set the stage for her career. I think that the skills that I've learned in 4-H will definitely help me in the future with being able to go out and make communications with people and be able to explain to people what's going on with their animal and be able to you know, go out into the world and take everything that I've learned here, like confidence and responsibility and preparation. I think those will be very important for my future career plans. I've learned many life skills that are going to be helpful. Being dependable, reliable, on time. You re people need you when you're there, and it's good to know that other people are there for you when you were there for them. And time management and always being prepared. Being prepared helps you, so if something comes along in the road, you're kind of prepared for it and don't get thrown off. Then there are the lessons learned of showmanship and market class. These young people learn early on to be competitive in both. In market class, the, the judge is judging the animal. They're judging their muscle composition, their um, structure, and basically just how the animal looks on that day. In showmanship, the judge is judging you as a person and how you react to your animal and how your animal reacts to you. So that judge is very easily able to tell if you spend time with your animal at home or if you don't. Oh, in showmanship, you need to work with your heifer or bull, steer, anything. You need to work with it every single day because if you go out in that ring and you have not worked with your animal and you do not have that bond together, it's going to be dead obvious. Like, they're going to know. Like, going out there, you and your animal are one. You don't move, they don't move, they love you, you love them. They're going to do what they're going to do for you and if you don't have that bond, they are going to go crazy. And let's not forget sportsmanship, a key aspect of the lessons these competitors learn in the show ring. When it's your turn, all eyes are on you, and these girls know it. You never know what little kid is looking up to you as their role model. You never know whose life you're going to affect by how they see you acting in the ring and how they see you acting outside of the ring. And 
it's just sportsmanship all around is like it's one of the most important things. Good sportsmanship is key to anything. Win or lose, yeah, we love to win, but without losing, you will never value winning. If you go out there and portray bad sportsmanship, you have little kids that are looking up to you, and you don't want them to follow in your footsteps in that way. You're not only representing yourself, your agents, your parents, you're representing the whole cattle industry, and that's very important to me, is to be a good sport. Bottom line, it was a good year at the Dixie National Sale of Junior Champions. People gathered once again, animals were sold, scholarships were earned, and most importantly, young people grew just a little bit more. Congrats to Tatum and Lily, and good luck. That was Jonah Holland reporting, veteran himself of the Dixie National. That's right, Mike. Well, next time on Farm Week, medical marijuana. While 17 states have reaped a windfall from the recreational market, more than twice that number have embraced the medical side since California led the way. One, Iowa is tiptoeing further. The top reason customers want it, pain management. But medical marijuana is expensive and it's not covered by insurance. Do the benefits outweigh the risks? That's next time on Farm Week. Remember, if you missed a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube as well. See you next week. Thanks for watching.